This is the cell that belonged to Mr. Mandela. Now, what we haven't got here, which came later, of course, is a bookcase, uh, a table, and and a chair. That we haven't got. The rest of it is is the same. We have, there are no flush toilets here, so this was the toilet bucket. Uh, the mats that you see here. Uh, it's for the first 14 years, we slept, <coughs> sorry, we slept on the ground uh, on two mats uh, and three blankets. Uh, beds came after 14 years. Uh, I'm not being specific because some people got beds a bit before on doctor's orders, but generally uh, beds came after 14 years. The other significant thing is that this window here at the back of us, no, the top two window panes were not there and the window was sealed, so it brought in more cold. And they had no reasonable explanation why they kept that open, <coughs> except that uh, it was colder and it was more punishment. <coughs> so when we moved into the, this section of the prison, and we were the first occupants of, together with about 20 other people, uh, some, of, some of the cells, the paint was still wet, uh, the cement had not uh, quite uh, stiffened. So that is the story of the cell. Uh, the lighting? The lights were on all night uh, because of a ma uh, maximum security prison. But uh, there were some ridiculous regulations. Only people who were formally registered to study, either with college or university, were allowed to study were allowed to have pen and paper. The others were not. Those who, And only people who could afford it were allowed to register. So the bulk of the prisoners could not afford this and were not allowed to study. But the regulation stipulated that if you are registered for standard 8, you sleep at 8 o'clock with the lights on. If you register for standard 10, you sleep at 10. If you registered with UNISA for university, you sleep at 11. Anyone found with a book after those hours is punished. Anything, writing anything or with a book, you are punished. Madiba wrote his, uh, the basis of what was, what became Long Walk to Freedom. That was written in prison. What happened there is that uh, one morning, Susuro and I were walking in the courtyard here. And uh, that was in 1974, 75, 74. When we thought, well, Madiba's birthday is approaching in 78, his 60th birthday, and we should make a political statement. And the only thing we could do is suge we suggested that he should write his autobiography. If that is published, it would make uh, quite a, a political statement. And that gave birth to the to the idea of the book. We saw him and he agreed readily, but it was a highly secret uh, enterprise. What was your greatest deprivation in prison? What was the thing that you missed most? Well, there were various deprivations, as you know, in prison life, but the greatest deprivation was the absence of children. Uh, you know, the waters could be very nasty also, for instance, when we were working at the quarry, at the lime quarry, during school holidays, children, not very little ones, but kids, school kids would wander into, uh, towards the quarry, and before they could even approach, they were chased away, so that we couldn't see kids. Uh, babies under two were allowed to come with their mothers, but then, uh, until the age of 16, they were not allowed. Madiba saw his two little girls when they were two and three, and the next time he saw them was when they were 16. Now, I used to stand uh, on a bench in my cell and look out to the street when the warders and their families were walking towards the harbor so I could see a child from a distance. But when I physically saw a child and held a child and put her on my lap, and that was by accident. That was at Paul's Moor, and that was after 20 years. Her father was a lawyer, 
and she had come with but she wouldn't stay in the car. She was about three and the warders relented and allowed her to come in. And that was no longer a consultation because uh, it was such an experience for me, uh, unexpected and, and a thrill that I could never forget. So she just sat on my lap and there was no talk of law anymore. It was just child sitting on my lap and I kept on stroking her hair and you know, went back to myself. You know, I don't know if it was all, if I was all there because just the thrill of this experience, you know, stayed with me and it remained with me all the time, just that. You gave up quite a lot, didn't you? I mean, you were the youngest of the group um, in the prime of life, sacrificed your... Did you have any regrets? Do you have any now? No, uh, I don't have any regrets. Uh, it's easy to say that now, of course, but already that time when, already when I was outside prison, before the arrest, the organization had given me and others an option of uh, going into exile. In my case, uh, I was told that I should open the ANC office in Indonesia. And I said, no, I don't want to go out of the country. Then a suggestion was made that I should just go temporarily to Swaziland and then come back. I said, no. Until a certain day in 1963, I was ordered by the organization to go underground. By that time I was under house arrest. I was under house arrest, uh, I was the second person in the country to be under house arrest, Helen Joseph being the first a week before me. And uh, house arrest made things very difficult, just impossible to do work. Fortunately I was under 13 hours house arrest and I had an explanation uh, to the authorities. Uh, I had taken on, not seriously though, but friends of mine who were running printing presses, they allowed me to use their names as a printing representative. So I did bring some work to them, but that was a front, so that I had something to show to earn a living. And that's why Unlike quite a lot of my colleagues who were uh, house arrested for 24 hours, I was only house arrested for 13 hours a day and then weekends of course and holidays. So this thing helped me being a printer's representative. Uh, exile, uh, I had read about exile before I went to prison and I know the difficulties of exile. Not, a, not experienced it but I've read about it and I just did not until I was ordered by the organization when I did not go into exile to go underground in the country. And that is how I landed at Lilith Fong. But there was also the consideration of what sort of example you would give by, by going into exile or rather staying in the country uh, to give an example to, to the rank and file members of the ANC. What had happened in those years is uh, the Iran Daily Mail used to have a little front page box House arresty number so and so flees House arresty number such and such flees So the police let out that Sasuba and I were still in the country and they were searching for us uh, That. Eventually, of course, I mean, people came to know that and they appreciated that, that there were still people in the country. Of course, there were others as well. Uh, it, it did help to keep the, the spirit uh, alive, that not all of us, because there was a perception that when the paper said flee, uh, people wouldn't think that many of them were sent out of the country to do work outside. But the perception was these are people who could not stand things and so there was a perception of that sort also. But personally it took its toll on you. I mean you were in love at the time. You had a, a love affair yeah. deep, deeply, deeply. Well, and fortunately Sylvia was also a political person and during our trial she was detained as well. 
and uh, thereafter, of course, she faced a trial and she was sentenced to imprisonment. So uh, there was that consideration. The dangers were there because the Immorality Act was still very much uh, there and the Mixed Marriages Act was there. But being political, we could understand each other, what the risks were and uh, what the future holds, if there was going to be a future.